back to the morning show here on the Rise News. I am Adesua Omoruan. Rafa Yaseni. And I am Sheito Atigari. Well, it's been a very hectic uh, morning for road users along the VI Ikoi axis, including Rufai. You oh, almost yeah. didn't make it to work I this morning at this time. I, I, I barely, I barely got uh, so we do understand there was a tanker uh, yes. accident. The tanker, the tanker fell. Yeah. Uh, give so, us an update. So, so from what, what I gathered, there was a tanker uh, that fell over and crossed both sides of, I mean, one side of the road, I think around 6 or 7 a.m. this morning. And that's on the Zumba, uh, by the on, way. On Zumba, by the way, uh, road. And there was a spillover, definitely. Traffic, there was a backlog. So I was coming straight off the near down here. There was a backlog. It was mad. I was in that traffic for well over an, over an hour. And, and it was just uh, just very painful. But as and that's a journey that should take you how long? That's that's a journey that would normally take me ten minutes max. Mm. Ten minutes max. Uh, but the, the 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 good thing, and I must have to commend the authorities in Lagos. The state response. As the response was good. It was swift. They've been able to, you know, they had a combined team of last man firefighters. They they got the tanker off the place. But my fear and concern is that people are we're scooping fuel from mm. the gutter because it spilled into uh, the gutter on that the Zumba and that, that demarcation the gutter. And they're scooping for, and that's not good enough. And cars were driving around. Yeah, we're good. Car, cars actually. were driving yeah, around. The heat that. from the car might just, you know, trigger up something. And they were scooping for, as a free for all. Very, very terrible scene. Police truck right there. What they, what they should, have, what they are supposed to have done is to stop traffic and create an. Alternative. And so, and that's the part so I don't get. You know, yes. why would you still put the truck? And so, so that's the tank that the tank that fell off, mm -hmm. still laden with, you know, petroleum product. Why would you leave that tank there? I know they're about to carry it, but I hope they still carry that. But as of the time I got there, mm. it was still there. You can see a lot I'm of people okay, skipping so for a lot of I'm grateful cotton. that, you know, there was no explosion. And no, 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 it was, 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 was well managed. Lost. It could have yes. been a catastrophe, but it was well managed. Great. And so let's move on now to the conversation of the day. Globally, people leave their homes for many reasons. While some are fleeing prosecution, others are searching for better economic opportunities. That is why every year thousands of people attempt to migrate to a different country without a valid visa or permit. Many are not fully aware of the financial, physical and psychological costs of choosing to migrate irregularly. While some people waste time and money, others face abuse and exploitation and even some lose their lives en route. However, many irregular migrants who embark on the journey to Europe in the hope of building a better future are not usually aware of the different challenges they may face upon arrival in Europe. And so, just how important is it for migrants to be skilled? Well, here in Nigeria, the empowerment of migrants is already in process. And joining us now to shed more light on this is Enito Ibirunke, a social sector advocate and migration expert. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. Thank you for having me. Uh, so, more and more, uh, migrants are viewed as financial and demographic burden on host countries or destination countries. This concept of empowering migrants. Tell us how and if it is impacting that narrative. Well, thank you very much. The truth is that it's very important to realize that migrants need to be empowered. Now, while we may say migrants, most people wonder why would you say migrants? Mm. Now, initially, what we've had for many years and which still goes on is human capital development, people empowerment. But the reality for Africa and Nigeria in particular is that we're, es we're driving out, we're escaping out of Nigeria in our, in our millions, not just in our thousands anymore. Mm -hmm. And so it's becoming an issue to look at on both sides. Now, you have the side of where people are skilled and they're competent and the migration reasons able to go properly and get to destination country and add value. But then you have the other side of migration, which is creating a scourge on the image of Nigeria. And that's the issue of irregular migration. When we look at that area, we're talking about people who decide that I want to leave my country, Nigeria in this case, and I want to go to another country, and we're looking particularly in this instance at European countries, and I want to go through the Mediterranean, I want to go through the desert, I don't mind how I get there at whatever cost or whichever way. And at that point in time, you're looking at people who are going and are not going to add real value at the beginning of the journey or at the time they get there because there's not much that they have to add financially and economically. Now, so what's then happened is that the international community, and in this case in reference to the European Union, looked at and said, okay, let's, well, let's look at, let's talk with the AU, let's talk with African leaders. Where exactly, what are the push factors for migration? One of the push factors for migration are economic. And so when you look at that, how then do you change the narrative? 
It's not enough to say, let's create awareness campaigns about the risks and realities, which is ongoing very predominantly. And then they also realize that it's not even enough as well to say, let's just empower returnees, people that have come back, which is being done very actively and extensively by UN migration. The point then became, let's look at this category of people called potential migrants. Mm. People that are likely to leave, and we dare say that we are all potential <laughs> migrants. That's the truth. It's just how <laughs> well, one, we we're, 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 we're half of a body out and half our body in. Mm. Fact, but the question, you don't know if some people are working on it already. <laughs> you see, now, the truth is, if you're working on it already, that means that you are at least looking at some way where you're going to add value. You are, you are building up your skills. Now, we're looking at the category of Nigerians who are potential migrants who want to go there and they don't know what they're going to go and do there. So that's where in issues of skilling up and reskilling come up. And so you're having a lot of initiatives that have come up because of interventions across board. And one of such, which is very, very, which has come up last year, was done by the federal government. And it's under the Ministry of Labor and Productivity and Employment. It says, let's look at migrant resource centers. What are the issues around it? What are we, the information about migration? What about the things that need to go on? How do people know legal ways to go? How, what are the options? Now, out of that, being that that's not the only initiative, you've had even state governments take up initiatives. You've had a lot of stuff in Edo State. You've had stuff in Lagos State. Yeah. So with Edo State, you've had Edo jobs. Now, these initiatives usually look at the bigger picture. But then, like I said earlier on, they narrow down to say this particular segment of people, which covers a lot of people, majorly people within the ages of 16 to 34. Mm. And so you had one of the such initiatives is the Lagos State Employment Trust Fund Initiative, which says, okay, we're giving, we're doing a lot of vocational skills training to, put, to young people, 16 to 34. But then at some point, because of the work which has been done around migration awareness mm. in Nigeria, now, one of the people, a lot of people then came, some bodies came and said, you see, within Lagos here, and we work that has been done in communities, mm -hmm. you know, that the communities we've gone to across board from the migrant we have seen that. We have a lot of, our work was talking about migration awareness, and the problem that keeps coming up from a lot of them is that if we stay back, what are we staying back to do? How do we get to feed? How do we get to take care of things? And so you find that under that, a lot of potential migrants were identified and sent into these projects. And so from there, good thing that you have success stories. Mm. Because even just as, as recently as day before yesterday, one of those people that were that went through the vocational skills training, and now you have a lot of... Initially, for me, I felt the, the vocational skills, I looked at it and thought... Do these vocational skills really add up in the big picture? So you had things like masonry, carpentry, you had welding, you had gold, you know, things that were not the regular things. And so one of them... It does. <laughs> you, know, I, you know, maybe because you know, I'm thinking from the point of a lawyer, uh, I mean, someone who's gone through the normal, regular, formal form of education. So no, not low skills. You know, and I realized, it's, interestingly, one of the people who graduated from the program, I know you also, the intervention came for those programs from United, UNDP, from GIZ, a lot of international bodies that are trying to say, how do we cope the African menace? And one of the boys that had graduated from LSTF projects had gone on to now go add, to add on and started a small mini factory mm -hmm. where normal jewelry that, you know, I know women and jewelry, regular jewelry that they sell cheaply everywhere, he got it. And then what he had learned was that you go plate them. And so they do not, so it becomes like the GL that women wear and things, yeah, yeah, yeah. and it never, it does not tarnish anymore. And the guy at his graduation, at his, when he was lodged, he called the people that, you know, some of our team members and said, please come. In fact, my colleague was saying to us that he was just hugging her and saying thank you. And this was a potential migrant. This was yeah. a potential, and, and, and a potential so, migrant. So let me, let me, let me put this in there. And, and it's exciting, you know, we, we, we're here to tell the good side, you know, and the good stories uh, this morning. But how can we also tell them that you can actually create industries like one of them did create? Yeah. And, and why I said it does is, I mean, it might not be readily available in this part of the world. Yes. In the UK, I know Plimco was a vocational skill guy. Mullins started up. It built a plumbing company worth over 30 million pounds. And so increasingly, we need to start telling these migrants that even with these vocational skills, you can make things work. Masonry, for instance, is a big deal. See a lot of building projects going on here and there. Yes. So how can we, you know, put this message out there 
for them again and rehash it and tell them that forget this tie we are wearing. You know, I could even pull it off if you want. Well, <laughs> well, true. You see, that that really is true. What you have said is essentially very true because, for instance, uh, during the project, during the course of the project that was on, especially because we, I personally through my organization and was very involved in that project in some level because I mean facilitating soft skills. And what happened was that a lot of them had, like you said, potential migrants had the notion that I get trained and I go and look for a job. Mm. Now the jobs are not available readily, mm. especially for, you know, for vocational skills, TVET skills. They're not available. So one of the things that started happening was encouraging young people, potential migrants. And when we say young people, it's actually not exactly young people because you have a lot of, the ages is 16 to 35. At 35, you stop being young. At some point, for some of the vocational skills, the age limits were raised to 45, especially for caregiving. Mm. So let's just say potential migrants. You say, right, that there might not be available jobs like you have rightly pointed out. So you need to start to create your own opportunities. Yeah. But then again, one of the factors that, are very, that is very key to note in empowerment of potential migrants is that it's not just a deterrent to say don't migrate. Mm -hmm. the, do not migrate is not the final message, actually, mm -hmm. because migration is a human right. And International Migrants Day, which is celebrated on the 18th of December, at the, as of last year, the theme was my, safe migration, migration with dignity. So you're looking at the fact that migration with dignity is the point. At any point in time, as human beings, we have the right to move from one space to the other. But am I adding value? Yeah. Such that you can then become properly certified to say, I want to leave Nigeria. I want to go to another country. I'm going to add value there. And when yeah. I get there, I will actually be able to still reinvest my money back in my country. Yeah. Because one of the things that you find is that if you, have good put, if you have good migrants, migrants with good skills going abroad, you still have family ties home here. Oh, yes. And so you're still going to be able to invest your money back here. You're able to actually even then go further and then get more, more skilled. Now, one of the things that is looked at is when we look at alternatives and empowerment issues, we're looking at real valid scholarships. We're looking at, for instance, if you look at Norway, Norway, Switzerland, they're, they're, the Norway has a lot of scholarship options for people in filmmaking. Now, Norway naturally may be more expensive to live in than other European countries. But then when a lot of people do not even realize that putting in the right applications, putting, skilling yourself up, you can get into those places. Yeah. So the message out here today on migrant empowerment is really that things may be bad, but the, on us, the duty is on us to know what opportunities exist locally, what opportunities even exist out of Nigeria that we need to be able to get into. And then you ask the question, that how do we pass the message across? And I always say this any time I get that question. One of the best ways we can get the message across, other than community engagement, which we do, I mean, and a lot of other organizations, CSO organizations do, is the media. The media is the, the media is the strongest tool. You're what, here. Are you, what are we doing right now? <laughs> and we need to do more of it in different forms. Because the truth is, like we said, mm. all four of us and a lot of people listening are our potential migrants. But it's just that one thing that you find is that right now, in the new space of things, with a lot of initiatives and empowerment options, you have the insistence that people must come back to Africa. So you get a scholarship scheme, for instance, from anywhere. So I one, one very clear one that is very clear and that I know of because one of my mentees was, is involved in the process is Africa Leadership Academy in South Africa. You must be expected that if you get you go and you actually get a scholarship. So you can get a scholarship to almost the full payment for you. And, and annually, it's about $31,000. Okay. So you are from a low-income family. Of course, you can't afford that. But you get a scholarship. You say that 10 years after you have finished your whole process, go to the university, get your master's, you give, we handhold you through the process of getting a good job, you must spend at least 10, 10 years after that, you must spend in Africa developing the continent. And they monitor their alumni across board. So you find that those things are happening there. The essence at the end of the day is let's empower potential migrants. Let them know that there are opportunities. Let them skill up. But then we have to come back home and develop our own economy, mm. our own society with the knowledge and skills that have been gotten. I like the fact that we have focus on potential migrants. However, I would like us to talk about returning uh, migrants, people okay. that have been through that. We're going on a short break. We're, uh, very, we're going on a short break. When we come back, we'll talk about that. This is still The Morning Show.
Welcome back to the morning show here on Arise News. We're still joined in our Lagos studios by Enito Ibirunke, a social sector advocate and migration expert. Now, before the break, I was to we're talking about, you know, potential migrants. Yes. But I want to focus on people that have gone through this process and have had to return. Now, um, looking at uh, the joint initiative between the IOM and the European, the European Union, one of the things that they focus on, apart from financial literacy and, um, and job empowerment, is psychological and social support. Now, we know that a lot of these people, because of what they've been through, you know, they've been through trauma, uh, trauma they've experienced things that they, on, a normal, on a regular day they probably shouldn't have. Mm -hmm. Now, how do we begin? Because I feel like that's the first. Before you even reintegrate them back into society, they have to have gone through some sort of psychological support mm -hmm. uh, system. So how do we make that transition? And what, what, we, what are you even doing now to make sure that these people are ready to be reintegrated back into society? You see, you've asked a very loaded question, I must say, a highly loaded question. Now, the first challenge with the question, not the question, I mean, with the situation you've painted is that they're coming back into a society where ordinarily for even people who haven't decided to go through that kind of trauma do not even have the facilities you're talking about. So you're finding that in Nigeria, for instance, you can't tell someone that you want to see a shrink. They ask, are you mad? Something wrong with you. Therapy is like, oh, what does that mean? Therapy? Or are we, what are you talking about? You have too much money. Why? Are you <laughs> <your> money? <laughs> That's even if you now mm. do find a therapist that is doing that as just what I'm doing. You're not going to find it as now we have life coaches and co. But at the same time, it's still not exactly, if we're going to be honest with ourselves, the way it is in developed parts of the world. Sort of basic, yeah. Yeah. Yes. So when you're now talking about them come back, the most that people can do really is to say, and which is why they... IOM and other initiatives are saying, let's actually look at financial empowerment, let's set, up, let's set you up in businesses and co. What is then happening now is, and in terms of psychological rehabilitation, as you're saying, it's still pretty much very iffy and very dicey. Because a lot of the people themselves have that notion, because on counseling, when our local migration experts go to the streets or go to the communities, you find a lot of returnees telling you that, I'm going back and that's simply because when they come back home, number one, they do not have anything that they bring into the table personally themselves. Because when they left initially, some of them did not feel that what they had was that much. Even mm -hmm. though some of them would have, I, there was a guy, a man in particular, that had two laundry shops, had a few employees, and decided, sold everything, laid off the staff, and then decided to go. Because he felt this wasn't enough for me to live on. And so when they come back, there's, that, there's no source of income already. Mm -hmm. So even with the empowerment that is also, you're now talking about psychological. Well, I, the only side, we have one major psychiatric hospital in Lagos, Yaba Left. I mean, we all call it Yaba Left, so to speak. Lagos, you know, psychiatric hospital. The next thing we have that I know of that we talk about is the one in Aru, the um, Abel Kota, is, or, you know, Ogun State. Mm -hmm. So when you're looking at it really and truly, the ra real reality now is that there's going, to be need, there's going to be need for a lot of collaborations with psychologists, psychiatrists, and all. And in fact, this is, I do see, even on our team, the Migrant Project, will say, is there a need for, psych for us to have a psychologist on board? Mm. Because even for those who have to counsel them, talk about it, go and create awareness about it on air, you find that you're traumatized by the stories you hear. Yeah. Okay. For instance, the story of a man who went, left his, went with his wife and his children, and along the line said, okay, let's all split. So you go, your wife go this way, your children go that way. And at the end of the day, he got deported. He got sent back from Libya. His wife, he doesn't know if she's alive anywhere. The children has no idea. Or what about the women that you find that they go on the journey, they're raped, some get pregnant, the children are removed from them, you know, so many things. So listening to those stories, even the people who work on migration issues, when you look at the human angle of it, need therapy. Indeed. So <laughs> I, it's, a, it's a tall order. Something that's being looked into, initiatives are going to come up, but the immediate and most pressing reality is how to at least get them to reintegrate back into society Sorry. on the financial and economic okay. level. Mm. All right. I have two questions for you. And, and first is, I'd like to understand from what you've observed so far, do migrants have enough information before they embark on these journeys? Uh, what's the source of the information they get from your observation and statistics? And secondly, we're talking about this empowerment. To what extent is this empowerment uh, being offered? Is it prior to departure from, um, hosts, uh, from their countries to host country? 
or does it extend to their period of stay in those countries? Because I'm talking about issues of identity, um, issues of rights, you know, issues of hot sports areas in those countries they're going to. Should this empowerment cover that stretch? Or is just, you know, prior to this trip you want to make, this is the information you need, and that's all. Well, see, first thing, the first primary source of information for potential migrants is usually family and friends or other people who have gone on the Internet. So you find that social media has played a lot of, has played a huge role in how people view their migration plans. Mm. So you find your friend or somebody you went to school with, I see that person on social media in front of a nice car in some place somewhere abroad saying, I'm leaving La Vida, I'm leaving well. <laughs> you know, and so that's the first place. It was as a result of that research that led in 2017-2018 say a lot of statistics showed that most migrants, at least you're looking at looking out of 10 migrants, most of them had little information about the real realities of what it would be, what hotspots would exist. So when they're talking about going, they're thinking that it's just a two weeks journey. So I'm going to go from Nigeria, I'll cross into Libya, from Libya, I'm going to just go through the desert. We're just doing it, it, it's tourist activities. Mm. And from there, we're going to see the Mediterranean. Because truly, when you're, at the, at the, when you're on the Mediterranean, you're literally seeing the other side. And so it looks like, it's like one one on the road. I know before they built up all that part of Ozumba, at some point there was a jetty there. Back then, you would see, you could see Ikoi. Mm -hmm. And so it looks like, I used to ask myself, can I swim across? Yeah. Like, I swim. <laughs> so, I can <laughs> so I can imagine that people who already have a high sense of desperation mm -hmm. just think, and so somebody tells you, look. And then you know that back then in the 80s and 90s, if we're going to be honest, we have a lot of people that we know that, have, that, we, that started doing so well. Yeah. I remember that, and you hear, oh, she, oh, this madam, she has two salons or three big shops in Ikoi and VI, and she lives in Spain. Oh, yeah. That's all she lives in Italy. And she bought the money in Spain. And she really did. She, she did. She really, really did. I, 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 know, I know cases like that. That's it. I mean, I know someone that, oh, when, you know, before I got involved in migration work, and I was like, wow, this woman's salon, everything was all so amazing. Spain she was, was so fantastic. nice. Spain was, even I felt Spain is good. Oh, <laughs> but, you know, so they have those stories before it became that, oh, there's a clamp down on irregular migrants. Yes. Now, the information is from friends and family. Now, in the last two years, that narrative has changed because the international community in conjunction, the UN Migration, UNDP, UNESCO, UNICEF, a lot of the UN bodies, UN, you know, and the United Nations um, High Commission for Refugees, as well as a few other organizations in Nigeria, where it was the Migrant Resource Center, the Migrant Project, are putting out information about the awareness. Now, look, this is the reality of trying this journey. It's not a two weeks journey without crisis. Now, one of the major hotspots is Libya, which is what most people are not told. Because, you know, when you think about it, you just think it's not just to go through a country. It's, it's really like, we know Nigerians are not averse to hardship, adversity, and travel. So you don't think of it as you think, you hear people say, with all I've gone through in Nigeria, for instance, we had a blackout, nationwide blackout. So if you survive a nationwide blackout without so water, I mean, without, you just feel, how bad can it be? We'll just keep it. They don't think of it that way. So they don't know. So now it's starting that Libya is a largely ungoverned territory. Yeah. After the fall of Gaddafi, it's not a place where you have prop and they know. Now let's leave it's just like saying within Libya, but you are going through the desert. At this point in time, there are different Libyan coast guard, Libyan coast guards, yes. so the borders to control and so many things that they don't know about. Now that information started going out. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the reasons why last year UN migration set up a UN radio to create awareness. MRC as well, which is what I mentioned earlier on, has information how, is it widespread enough? Are people accessing it? Do they know about it? Mainstream. Now, mainstream, because mainstream media is not really carrying it that much. Yeah. Now, they've also been the use of social media. Mm -hmm. But then I can authoritatively say that, because I f try to follow it, on social media, it's not, I know there was only one particular person that I saw actively put up some work because she, you know, she had to do that. She, I don't know what, but it's not been so, how do I put it? The awareness, because it's, it's, it's not pervasive Yes, enough. because you look at it and say, it's a... It, so, so, it's not pervasive enough, you wanted to say. No, I, I, yes. I, I wanted us to, because for the of time, I wanted us to talk about resettlement okay. uh, before I quickly ask one or two questions. Okay. Uh, uh, as, uh, or let me just add it to the yes. second question on resettlement. Modern day slavery is another big one. Hmm. 
and, and this is as a result of uh, you know irregular migration. And another thing, please, by any chance, do you know how those people that came from South Africa are doing? Because <laughs> I, I think we in the media, we've done them a disservice. We've not followed up on their backstory. Mm. We just saw them came back to the country. We saw them give them recharge cards. But we've not followed up on them. And maybe we might mandate ourselves here to do something like a story of that. Mm -hmm. You know, do you know how they are doing? Because we, we don't know anything about them again. You see, the truth is this. Like, one of the things that, this is a major question. Now, in terms of resettlement, what we can it's properly says that a lot of people complain about being able to resettle properly into the into the society. Yeah. Now, with regards to the South African returnees, let me put them that way, it's not clear what has happened to them. I would, I would be honest about that. And then if you say, can the media do a lot more and can you take off the money, that would be awesome. It would be amazing if you actually decide to take on the mandate to say, what do we want to do in terms of resettlement across board? How do we follow up on the stories? We had a, my, a journalist workshop yesterday, and the questions around it was, uh, what stories is, would people in the media be creating around migration issues? Beyond the gory, people are 100, people have died, 20,000 people have, are rescued, people are deported and returned. And this kind of questions is awesome that you're asking it and you're bringing it up. So for resettlement, the first thing is this. That is why at the end of it all, in across board in all the conversations around migration anywhere in the world today, we're asking ourselves and the answers are you need to begin to do people empowerment. You need to be able to put the power for people to take charge of their lives in their own hands. And make informed decisions. And make informed decisions. Mm -hmm. Because there's no way that no, no government in the world is going to be able to solve all the problems of the citizens. You can only create an enabling infrastructure. But in a situation where we have Africa, where we know that Africa has got peculiar characteristics, it's more important to do human capital development of the people themselves by placing in their hands skills to able, be able to make, make them make good decisions. Very well said. All right, I mean, very, very well said, and we we'll definitely will follow up on, on that. And all the wonderful work you've been doing. Modern day slavery too is another one that stems out of, oh, yes. of things like this. Uh, yeah. I, I, <laughs> with modern day slavery. Just, just make a quick comment because I know we're pressed for time and we need to go for okay. a quick, quick break. Just okay. make a quick comment. Modern day slavery really ends up being looking at the fact that you're looking at inflows into modern day slavery, incoming irregular migrants coming into Nigeria and also we Nigerians going out there to become modern day slaves. But the dynamics are slightly different. Thank you so much. Really appreciate you. Uh, thanks for your time. It's now time for a short break. Where we come back, we'll have Agata Mata as we discuss her journey so far. She turns 50. Stay with us.